Hello and welcome to Greg and Felicity Adventures. I'm Greg and today Felicity is behind the camera. And as you may know, we make travel adventure videos. If you don't, what we do is a little something like this. But some of you have been asking to see some more of us in between all of our big travel adventures. So we thought we'd make a series of videos, all sorts of different things. If you'd like to follow what we're doing, then please hit the subscribe button, the like button, leave a comment below. That is the admin out of the way. So today what we've done is we've asked some people what questions they would like to ask to us as we begin making our travel adventure videos. First up, Huxley Magic asks, what experience did you guys do that cost the least but was the most memorable? That's a really difficult question. Huxley, by the way, is a fellow magician down here on the Isle of Wight. And the reason that question is so difficult immediately is because there are some things we do which are incredibly inexpensive for the actual experience, but it costs a lot of money for you to actually get there. But the first thing that leapt into my head when I heard that question was the Bat Cave at Calic Mall when we were out in the jungles in Mexico. It cost you absolutely nothing to go to the Bat Cave. We drove up the road about two miles from our hotel, parked up in a little lay-by type area, no parking charge or anything, you have to take a little bit of a hike through the forest and then you come to this big cavernous pit going down into the ground and when we first arrived there were the beautiful little hummingbirds flittering around, had a great chance to try and practice filming a hummingbird. If you ever get the chance to, to try and film a hummingbird you'll find out just how difficult that is because by the time you've actually finally got them into focus they've gone again. And then slowly as the sun started to set we were looking down the cavern, there was a big cave at the bottom and you see the first couple of bats come fluttering out and then slowly more and more bats come out until you've got thousands, literally thousands of bats spiralling up out of this cavern. It looked like the, the key room in the first of the Harry Potter films and they're spiralling upwards and then off up over your heads and flying off into the sky. It is an incredible experience and it just goes on and on and on. You kind of think, well, obviously there are loads and loads of bats, but there are so many bats at one time and it just goes on and on and on for so long. Just seeing that many bats flying free in the wild, we stayed until well after the sun had finally gone down and had a night trek back through the forest. And to have that kind of experience and to have paid nothing extra to do it was absolutely incredible. Jenny from Island Gems Fossil Hunts asks, as you are both fossil guides, will you be doing any videos with a larger fossil or geological component? Well thank you for that question and a cheeky plug there from the fossil trip company that Felicity and I do fossil walks for down here on the Isle of Wight. You can look us up if you're in the area. You will have seen in the Mexico video when we got down to the river in Palenque and Felicity got incredibly excited about the fossilised conchilia shells which we were not allowed to bring away with us, they are protected there. And then when we went to the Isle of Man, one of the things we particularly wanted to do was go down to the beach looking for the crinoid fossils there. Yes, we do like fossils. We really enjoy collecting dinosaur bone down here on our local beaches. So of course we have a dinosaur and fossil themed adventure planned. We don't know exactly when we're going to film that one. It's all just putting the right pieces of the jigsaw in place. But yes, there will be a heavily fossil and particularly dinosaur fossil themed video coming out at some point. Amy's Steampunk Emporium wants to know where there are a lot of snakes in Mexico. Do you know we didn't see any snakes at all while we were in Mexico. By the way Amy's Steampunk Emporium, thank you so much for that question. Amy's Steampunk Emporium actually made a lot of my steampunk stuff. Um, this gun here, the cannon gun on the table. Thank you so much for your question. I was actually really worried about snakes when we got into Palenque, not because I have a particular fear of snakes or anything like that, I actually got quite used to them when I was out in Italy, the place I used to stay just outside of Turin, very often I'd be out on a run and I would see vipers just curled up on the roadside, but I also knew from being there that you could be walking in the woods and you had to be incredibly careful, especially as it got hotter in the summer. You didn't want to accidentally stumble over a sleeping viper while you were out walking because it will surprise them. And with the thick grass, thick undergrowth out there in the jungle of Palenque, I was a little bit worried about the snake, but no. Lots and lots of lizards, beautiful lizards. Not one snake the whole time we were out there. 
Our next question is from Patch Barry. Have any of the locations you travelled to inspired any scenes in The Last Airship? Great question from Patch who plays Captain Morstan in our steampunk web series The Last Airship. Were there any things that have been inspired, not in the first series, not in any of the videos that have been filmed and released yet on The Last Airship, that was all filmed and set on the Isle of Wight and it was a fairly closed box sort of series we film most of it actually set inside the interior of the airship however for series two which is currently being developed and written yes there are inspirations the biggest inspiration i think for that was going to be the jungles out in mexico it was amazing when you went into the jungles how quickly you felt completely isolated from the modern world you'd go a couple of hundred yards into the jungle and suddenly you couldn't hear cars anymore you couldn't see anything modern and that really is going to play a part in Series 2 of The Last Airship. And I think also when we did our turkey adventure, the first time I'd ever been in a hot air balloon, and the first time Felicity had ever been in a hot air balloon, and that feeling of floating rather than flying, rather than having powered flight over the fairy chimneys, I think that is going to inspire some of the air scenes as well. Whereas in the first series it was all powered flight, the second series I think we might do a little bit more hot air balloon floating like we did over the fairy chimneys in Turkey. We've had a question from the Gosport Steampunk Society next. Is there anywhere in the world you would not want to visit and why? And we would like you to discount choices based on war and civil unrest, preferring a more personal reason. Okay, thank you to the Gosport Steampunks for that question. Quite a long one, so something there to get my head wrapped round for a moment. I think that there are places, obviously we would listen to any travel advisories and as you say you don't want us to bring civil unrest or war zones or anything into this. One thing we are not overly fond of is big cities. Felicity and I, we're both countryside people, there's a reason we live on a small island. We like having a bit of open air and space around us. We are not going to go on a a big city tour, we're not going to go to the big modern cities, that's just not us. Now those not something we would rule out completely, if we are in a country and there is a city and there is stuff worth seeing there we would definitely go along to it, but we're not going to seek out city destinations. I think if we're looking at something that would make us look at a place and say we're not going there, it would have to do with wildlife and the treatment of wildlife. One of the big things for us is we will not go to anywhere that has cetaceans in captivity outside of, of real sanctuary and medical reasons. We did in one of the places we went to in Mexico, we went to a water park and we found out that they had dolphins there and just standing there watching these dolphins. And we saw the dolphins at Magdalena Bay out in the ocean and just the distance that they were traveling and the whales as well just how far they were traveling in the few minutes we sat and watched them play and then you think of them being in a a tank no matter how big that tank is it is still way way smaller than the area they have and then being forced to come out and only being fed when there are tourists there to play with them so for us that is a really really big thing we want to see animals in the wild and particularly having seen what the life is like for the whales and dolphins in Magdalena Bay, we would just avoid going to any park that has cetaceans in captivity. Next question from the Shrewsbury Steampunk Festival. How much research do you do before a trip? Well that varies not just trip to trip but also between the two of us. By the way, if you want to see Felicity and I performing at a steampunk event, then we will be at the Shrewsbury Steampunk Spectacular that's coming up uh, towards the end of March. When we get down to planning, Felicity is a planner. She likes to have everything planned and figured out to the nth degree. I do joke sometimes about the dossier we get when we're about to go away. We have this bundle of information, everything is figured out, we've gone through, we figure out every price, everything down to the last detail, everything budgeted, we have hotels, we have all their addresses, every single piece of information, we have backup plans, we have backup information, we have information about what to do in the area, and if you ever had a chance to have a look at the calendar in Felicity's phone, you will see that that has even more information, plus it's all done with this intricate coding system of emojis for different things that you can 
need to look up. And me, on the other hand, I think if it was left down to me to plan most of our trips, we would probably end up the day before and I'd realise we didn't have a flight booked. I am not one of nature's planners. I like to try things out, see things as they go along. And so it works really, really well with us when we're doing our travel adventures because Felicity makes sure we got all the planning in place. We're all set, we're all good to go. And then when something goes wrong while we're there, it suddenly becomes my job. That became a bit of a problem for us when we arrived in Palenque. There's the little clip of me looking slightly stressed out and slightly relieved in the Mexico video. As we arrived there and the hotel we booked, first of all, we couldn't find it. I ended up having to ask in shops, I asked police officers, I asked at other places to stay. It was getting dark or it had got dark by the time we got there and the potholes and things in the road in Mexico, it's not a place you want to be driving a car at night and then eventually we went down this long dirt road even worse road than most of the ones we'd seen into the middle of nowhere and we'd booked this beautiful family bungalow and what we found when we arrived it was kind of like this ramshackle restaurant and we went in and the guy led us upstairs and we're thinking straight away hang on this is meant to be a bungalow led us upstairs and into this room and there were bits of the wall just missing there were animals there was lizards crawling across the walls you looked down and the, the floor had holes in it and you could just watch down to the restaurant below and at that point in time it was a case of well this clearly isn't going to suit us we're supposed to be here for several days we were both you know getting a little bit upset and at that point in time, it's my job to try and resolve things. And luckily, thanks to the kindness of a couple of really nice people, one lady that translated for us, the reception staff at the hotel we ended up in, we ended up staying in one of the nicest hotels in Palenque. So, yes, we do the planning, but we always have to be ready to make it up as we go along as well. And then on top of all that specific trip planning, we have a couple of whiteboards up in our lounge at home which have information about the next trip we're planning and then various notes on various other places we're planning to go throughout the course of the year. Rob says, so tell me Greg, I am sure some people will be fascinated to know the answer to both these questions. Where did you first find out that you could escape a straitjacket? More importantly, why were you putting one in the first place? Okay, that's a nice question from Rob from steampunk.global who make the fantastic coat that you will often see me in, in videos and photographs, and which you will see in some of the future travel videos when we go to places that are a little bit cooler, because frankly I like the way it billows. The question about the straitjacket, if you've seen our Isle of Man video, you'll have seen some of the clips of my show at the beginning, you'll have seen me doing some of my straitjacket escape. I actually got into that Oh, about 10 years ago now when I was planning a show and I was also watching a video about Houdini and the two kind of combined and I started to get more and more interested in escapes. The why I ended up in a straitjacket is far less interesting as how I learned to get out of a straitjacket because this was before I'd met Felicity. I did not have anyone in my life that I could just go to and say, okay, tell you what, I'm working on this new show and I'm going to do the straitjacket escape. I was out on tour in Italy while I was learning this and so I basically had to go to friends and other actors I was working with that I didn't know very well and just say to them, would you mind just popping into my room, putting me into a straitjacket and then just, just leaving. And I'd read a couple of books on the subject, that's about all I could find about learning how and the theory and the practice escaping from a straitjacket are very, very different things. And so I would, I'd have people just tie me up in it and leave and my basic rule was I had to get out. And the first time I did it, it was taking me sort of half an hour of time and a lot more effort and a lot more pain even than it is now. So over time that developed and it got better and better but it is just practice work, learning how to do it and then developing the strength and the muscles you need in order to make the escape. And just to clarify one important point, yes, it does hurt every time I do it. Next up from Luxury Shortbread. Of all the places you have visited, where was the best shortbread you have tasted? 
Okay, well that question obviously comes from Jeff from Luxurious Shortbread on the Isle of Wight. I know it comes from Jeff and not any of the other people on the team because none of the others would be that blatant with their plug. I would like to make some joke or comment about some rare Himalayan shortbread at this point in time, but the truth is I can't. Theirs is the best shortbread that I've ever tasted. However, just to make it not just a plug for them, let me make up a question that's vaguely related to food and talk about the best pizza I've ever had anywhere in the world. The best pizza and the best pizzeria are not the same thing, let's be clear on that. The best pizzeria anywhere in the world, in my opinion, is in Turin. It's a place called Nova Salette, run by a fantastic guy called Felice. It was my local pizzeria for all the years that I was living and working in Turin. And Felicity would probably want me to point out that the main reason that it is one of my favourite places in the world is every time I go into that pizzeria, I am greeted and I am introduced as Greg the Grand Attore, the great actor, which, you know, that's going to keep me coming back and buying pizzas. And they do great pizzas as well. However, the best pizza I've ever had in the world is actually not Italian. And I realise in saying that I am probably going to get a lot of comments and complaints from all of my Italian friends and I may even be outlawed from the country. But the best pizza I've found in the world is Turkey. They have a slightly different style of doing it, it's sort of wrapped over itself and it's just beautiful, exactly the right combination of pastry and filling, exactly the right quantities. That was absolutely wonderful and a complete surprise. We weren't expecting to find a different style of pizza in Turkey, let alone one that actually just 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 topped the Italian pizzas that I've had. The same is not true on ice cream, by the way. If you want pizza and ice cream, just go to Italy. Because while the difference between the Turkey and Italian pizzas is that much, the difference between the Turkish and Italian ice creams is huge. The Italian ice cream is absolutely wonderful. Go to a little gelateria. It's like nothing else on earth. If you try and go to a, a gelato selling ice cream company in the UK, it's not the same at all. It's a completely different thing. However, when we had the ice cream, the Turkish made ice cream, we had some in our last couple of days there just outside of Ephesus. And it kind of felt like they put chewing gum into the ice cream. It was a completely different texture. It was very, very tacky you were chewing ice cream and in my humble opinion ice cream should not be chewable and finally david smith says knowing you attend various steampunk events around the country where do you recommend people should go if they want to see the most steam powered machinery all fired up and working under one roof well that's not even pretending to be subtle is it are we getting commission for this no i didn't think so somehow David runs the Hereford Steampunk Weekend, among others I perform at throughout the year. Yes, I think what he's hinting at there is he wants me to say the Hereford Waterworks Museum, which is a fantastic collection of steam-powered machinery. Definitely worth heading up there in April if you want to come and see some of my performance and everything else that's going on at the Hereford Steampunk Weekend. But again, I'm going to take that question, which is a cheeky plug, and I'm going to twist it into a question slightly more related to our travel videos and say that for me as a steampunk and for those of you that don't know what steampunk is if you really don't know what steampunk is leave some notes in the comments and I might do a visit video on that at some point but for me of all of our travels so far the Isle of Man is just the most steampunk place it has that feel to it not just the steam train itself but also the electric trams the electric railways there's a narrow ga gauge railway that we didn't even get to go on while we're out there it is an incredible place and it really had that sense of victoria victoriana that sense of steam that sense of steampunk that i do really really enjoy it is one of the reasons that i thought it would be a great place to have one of our little travel adventures and a very good reason why I did the planning on it and not Felicity because she might have looked for something other than another steam train each day. Really, I could have just been on the trains and the trams just non-stop. Is that all the questions we got? Fantastic! That is the end of this little video. If you are enjoying this, we are going to be making more travel adventures this year. We've got plans for several of our big hour-long travel adventure videos. In the meantime, we're also going to be putting out these shorter videos too. So if you'd like to keep up with what we're doing, 
please hit that subscribe button, it's just down there somewhere. Please like, please, if you'd like to ask us a question, anything about what we do, leave that in the comments below, and then head over and watch one of our big travel adventures, maybe this one, here. Whichever one we're gonna advertise on this particular video. That's all for now, thank you very much for watching, goodbye, and take care.